Instagram pages. Our presentation tonight is the final chapter. We hope that through educational forums such as ours, we can raise awareness and take action to improve the lives of women. Recognizing the fact that our program in many cases will occur on the traditional territories of the First Peoples, we would like to acknowledge this as a sign of recognition and respect. Such a statement supports the protocol that is customary when one First Nation and another meet on or within the traditional territory of a First Nation. National Council of Jewish Women of Canada was the first Jewish women's organization created in Canada. We have been a catalyst for change since 1897, fighting to ensure the rights of women, children, families, the disabled and immigrants through advocacy, education and social action. In 1984, a killing of a Jewish woman by her husband prompted the Montreal section of NCJWC to act. They opened the first kosher Shomer Shabbat shelter in Canada for women and children affected by conjugal, conjugal abuse. As is the National Council of Jewish Women of Canada's way, we are often involved in seeing a need in the community and creating a way to address it. Once the seed had been planted, the section backed away as the community and its generous philanthropic families improved and expanded the vision. And in 1989, Ober Shalom was born. Our pioneering spirit continues within our five sections across Canada to this day, as we identify problems or voids within our communities and we work to address them. Through our international connections with International Council of Jewish Women and the Commonwealth Jewish Network, our national organization works to address such needs in the international realm as well. The Netflix series Made opened our eyes to the many faces of domestic violence. Our program tonight, Netflix Made, Is This a Reality for Canadian Women, will explore the reality of domestic violence within our midst. We're so pleased to present a dialogue between Joanna Cole, the Director of Development, and Tegan Webster, a clinical counselor, both from Aubert Shalom. Our speakers will address the audience for 30 to 45 minutes. We'll then have a chance for them to answer your questions. You can submit your questions at any time in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. Our speakers will address a selection of the questions submitted as their time permits. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Joanna and Tegan. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, I, my name is Tegan, and as Debbie said, I'm a clinical counselor at Aubert Shalom. And I'm going to give a, a quick, a little bit more info about us for those of you who are joining that don't know us. Um, we have two points of service here in Montreal, and we are open to everyone. We serve women and children from all cultural and religious backgrounds. Uh, but we do have a kosher shelter where we observe Jewish holidays and traditions and in order to always be able to accommodate Orthodox Jewish families at any time. Um, and so we have our first point of service, which is the emergency shelter where we have crisis intervention and counseling for the residents and a lot of advocacy and accompaniments. And then we have our Harper counseling office, which is our external site. Um, and I have been working with Ober Shalom for the last 15 years. Uh, and here we have individual counseling for women dealing with conjugal violence by appointment in a confidential location. We have a specialized program for children. Uh, we have a specialized program for the Orthodox community. And we also do a lot of accompaniments, accompaniments and advocacy here. One of my passions has become about ending violence against women in our country and in our society at large. And this year, according to the Femicide Observatory, halfway through the year, so months ago, 92 women and girls were killed in the first six months of 2021. All the experts in the field have been warning about the growing numbers, um, especially because of the many people who are living with abuse every day who we don't hear about in the news, which is one of the reasons that we loved this show so much because it got a lot 
a lot of people talking about it that had never talked about it before. Um, and my other special area of interest is helping women through their many legal battles, uh, whether it be in family court or criminal court or immigration. And um, we have started a fund over the last few years called Access to Justice, which was created with the idea of supporting clients in their legal processes, which often have unfair results for our clients. And is something that for those of you who have watched the whole series, uh, you see that in Alex's story, the difference between any old lawyer who doesn't know her particularly well versus uh, a very good top-notch lawyer can make all the difference. Um, so that's it. And the other thing, of course, for anyone who's interested in more about our services is that they are all confidential, free of charge, bilingual, inclusive, and accessible. And now I turn to Joanna. Hi everyone, uh, I'm, I'm uh, Joanna Kolb. I uh, am a social worker by training. I used to be a counselor in the shelter for a number of years. Um, I worked directly frontline with clients, um, then decided I wanted a different experience in the nonprofit world, left Auberge for a little bit and was really pleased to come back in the role of director of development uh, just before COVID hit March, 2020. Um, Auberge is, is an extremely special place, and I'm sure you'll you'll kind of glean that through our conversation as we as we go forward. But if we can just jump right into it, um, just going to warn everyone that if you haven't seen it, there will be some spoilers, as they say. We will be talking about things that have happened in the show, uh, so just just forewarning. Um, to, to know that that we, we will be giving stuff away. Um, and then I guess the next question I wanted to know is how many here in attendance? I see we've got, wow, 66 folks have, have tuned in. That's that's fantastic. How many have uh, have watched the show, have seen the series? You can type a, a yes in the chat or, or give a little thumbs up on, on the Zoom. We just kind of want to get a sense of. I'm seeing some hands and some thumbs ups. Okay, great. <laughs> Maybe Watch about half. Okay, good. So, so most of you will know um, what, what we're referring to when we're talking, because we really will be exploring specific themes in the show um, and how it relates to our experience working directly in the field. Um, the other thing we want to say is that Tegan and I really want this to be a discussion. This show has, has really put this topic on the table that has been so shrouded for so long. Um, we, we haven't been comfortable um, or felt safe really to talk about domestic violence. And so I, I, we really encourage the conversation. We want you to ask questions. We want you to jump in. Don't worry about interrupting us. Uh, you know, Type your question in the chat. We'll be monitoring it back and forth. If you've got something burning, unmute yourself and, and interrupt us. That's, that's really our goal here. It should be a back and forth and a conversation. Uh, don't be shy. There's no, uh, you know, there's no bad questions. We're all learning this together. And um, I'm just so pleased that there are so many people here that, that want to engage in this topic with us because it's, it's critical right now. So, um, that's, that's it that I have to say, and I will pass it back over to Tegan for a little review. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick review for those of you who are joining, who are interested in the topic, but have not necessarily seen the show. Maid follows the story of a young mother named Alex who escapes an abusive relationship and subsequently struggles to provide for her young daughter, Maddie, uh, by getting a job cleaning houses. It's worth mentioning because, you know, we've read a lot of the um, both the positive reviews and some of the, the more critical reviews that um, Alex is a white, able-bodied, smart, heterosexual, funny, attractive young woman. It's also worth mentioning that this is a Hollywood 10 episode series where the show creators have very publicly acknowledged that they didn't want to create 10 episodes that were only about suffering. So, you know, for, for the sort of critics who... Uh, are not comfortable with the funny moments or kind of making light of things, you know, they wanted to bring something else to it. Um, and obviously the series highlights the systemic barriers and the endless catch-22s that women leaving an abusive relationship often face. 
Uh, and the show displays the insidious forms and effects of emotional abuse, which is more rarely depicted on screen than physical abuse, without insisting that Alex be an ever broken victim. And I think that last part is really what had me so drawn to the show as someone who works day in and day out with victims, survivors of domestic violence. Um, and so, Joanna, I'm just gonna jump into the first theme that we wanted to explore. And again, just to reiterate, please, uh, if I don't see your hand go up, please type in a question or just take yourself off mute and jump in with a question or a comment. Um, but I'm gonna jump into the, a scene in the second episode where Alex has returned from court and she is in shelter with her new friend that she's just made in shelter who's comforting her. And she's lying on the ground of the shelter crying. And her friend says to her, you are a great mom. And she's, she's just come back. Um, she's just come back from court and the decision was for her daughter to go stay temporarily with the father for a week because she has seen, um, she has seen as having taken Maddie away from her father without notice, not filing a police report, and doesn't have anything to prove that there's been domestic violence. And so this is sort of one of, one of the many systemic barriers that we see. Um, and so her friend says to her, you are a great mom, as she's lying on the floor crying. And Alex says, no, I never should have left. He's a great dad and Maddie adores him and they're home right now, snuggling together. And I'm here in a shelter that I don't belong in. And the friend says, you're here because he abused you. And Alex says, no, he punched a wall. He punched a hole in a wall beside my head and I didn't do anything about it. I didn't file a police report and I didn't call the cops. The friend says, F the police report, punching, a wall, punching the wall next to you is emotional abuse. And so the thing that's hard and gonna be challenging for me about this talk tonight is that I could talk about this one scene probably for an hour. And so that's why, um, you know, I, I wanna cover as many topics as we can, but there's just so much that can be um, unpacked. And there's so much about that one scene that we see every day with our clients. This is the interaction. This is how she felt leaving her first day in court. So she musters up the courage to sacrifice everything, to sleep, you know, overnight at the, at the ferry, crossing place whatever that's called she's she's got no money in her bank account as you know they constantly show at the top of the screen um she doesn't have food she really has nothing and she's made all these sacrifices because she wants to protect her daughter and give her daughter a better life but the the first thing that happens in the legal interaction is that her child is taken so the criminal justice system as well as the family court system in the u.s where this show takes place, similar to Canada, is not built around the needs of a victim or survivor of domestic violence. It does not take into account the way that women are traumatized, not just by physical violence, but by persistent emotional, psychological abuse. Um, and for, for, for Alex and so many mothers that I speak with on a daily basis, seeing that a judge, a person of authority and lawyers working with them decide to place her daughter who she's trying to protect with the man who she felt so unsafe with that she fled in the middle of the night with. It's really, it really highlights what we're trying to overcome when we want to raise awareness, when we want to get people talking about it, when we want to not only demystify what domestic violence is for the population at large, but to make sure that the people who are interacting with the survivors of domestic violence understand the way that the traumas that they've been through actually affect where they're at, how they're able to communicate, how they're able to try to fight for themselves with very little resources. And um, Joanna, feel free to interrupt me anytime, but I, it, it made me think of a day that I was in court this week with a client who, who's a survivor of domestic violence. And the lawyer who is amazing said to her at one point, I need to know that you want to fight this. Sometimes when I see you, you aren't saying much. It just makes me feel depressed. And I saw the look on the client's face, which was, you know, looking even more defeated. And 
keep in mind, this is someone who, this is a lawyer who knows domestic violence, who knows our organization, who is a top-notch lawyer. She's emotionally invested in this case, which is why she wants this client to, to get up and, and fight. Um, and so, you know, one of the roles that we play as counselors is on the one hand, having a conversation with the client and supporting them through the process uh, of being able to say, like, let me explain to you why I think the lawyer might have just said that and why you shouldn't take it personally. Um, and then having, you know, a more important separate conversation with the lawyer about, like, let's, let's get real about what she's been through, like the years of domestic violence that she's lived through, that she's survived. And all of the barriers that she's continuously faced as she is that day in court where things are not going her way. And so trying to help people, professionals and people around her in general understand that she can't act like she's ready to fight every minute because as she said to me at the end of that day, if I show my emotions about this, it opens up too many other difficult emotions that I can't really deal with at this point in my life. I've been through too much. So a lot of people that have been through trauma have to adopt um, certain, certain mind, sorry, I hear stomping above me. So I got distracted. Um, one of my children, they, sorry, just to, I, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, but just to, uh, as a final point, not only did she endure the trauma during the relationship, but when we see these kinds of experiences in court, we see how clients and women like Alex are further traumatized over and over again, not just by retelling their story, but by having to fight so hard to prove that they're deserving of help, to, to figure out if they're even deserving of help, regardless of what or wasn't reported to the police. Um, so I'm just gonna pause there because I realize I've gone on already quite a bit. And I just wanted to check in, Joanna, if you noticed if there's any questions. Yeah, so there is a question about if there's been an attempt to start a similar summer Shabbos, uh, shelter in Toronto. Um, I, I know that at, at one point there was in fact a number of years ago and I'm not sure exactly where it landed, but maybe we can circle back um, to the, the Toronto folks um, towards the end of this and explore that further. Okay, so, so do you wanna get into talking about what shelter life looks like on the show versus yeah, our shelter? So that's it. I think the theme to the second theme that, um, thank you, Tegan, by the way, for, uh, for kind of us walking us through that. I think for a lot of people, watching those first few episodes where Alex is like, she's just running head first into wall after wall. As she knows she needs a job to get the daycare. She needs the daycare to get the job. And um, all of these kinds of bureaucracies that women get caught in. And people might think like, oh, this is like glorified Hollywood, just trying to tell a good story, but it's not. We, we see that in our clients. We've, we've kind of watch them get caught feeling like they're, they're chasing their tail sometimes um, because the, the, the bureaucracies that exist kind of um, maintain, maintain systems of oppression that women need to, um, to function and fight against. Um, but if I'll segue now into, into the second theme is, is the shelter. It's so rare that you see a shelter on the screen. People have no idea what a domestic violence shelter looks like um, because of the nature of our, our client needs. Uh, we keep our shelter and all domestic violence shelters really are in confidential locations. Um, because of the, the anonymity of our clients, we very rarely show the inside of our shelter. Um, so people, have these ideas, they think it, you know, maybe it's a dormitory, maybe it's a penitentiary. What, you know, what does this shelter look like? Just the word itself, shelter, uh, can seem kind of scary. So um, the way that they showed it in made, I, I appreciated it. It was su such a rare glimpse. Um, and I guess, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna open the floor a little bit to everyone. And, and what were, were there any things that were you surprised? Um, you know, what did you, what did you take away from, from, 
from what you saw in the shelter? Is it what you had thought? Is there any words that come to mind when you think about um, Alex's time spent in this, in this safe shelter? You can feel free to, uh, to put it into the chat. So we're, we're a quiet audience and that's fine. <laughs> um, the, you know, and, and just a caveat before I start, um, I've worked at Ober Shalom. I've worked at other shelters, but not domestic violence shelters. So I'm really thinking about, um, I'm really providing a comparison to Auberge. Um, I've not seen every other shelter. I know vaguely other shelters in Quebec offer similar services and uh, look vaguely the same. But for example, in Ontario or across Canada, um, the, the services might be different. So I, I, I'm giving a specifically uh, Montreal context here. Um, so, so that said, you know, that, that first scene she pulls up at the shelter and, and the shelter counselor opens the door and you see Alex and she's kind of wide eyed and unblinking. And, you know, you can just kind of hear how terrified she is. And the shelter counselor says, breathe, you can breathe here. Um, and for me, that is the moment in the show when I started crying because I have said <laughs> those exact words to clients when they come in, when they walk through the door. We don't have that same, uh, you know, meet them at the car, they come to our door and women come through the door sometimes also like, what am I doing here? How did I get mm -hmm. here? Did I make the right choice? Do I belong here? Don't know what to expect. Don't know where they landed. Um, and it's those kind of deer caught in the headlights, a little bit frozen. And, and it's, it's just that moment where you take to connect to that person and say, you can breathe here. You know, this is this is a safe place, um, and and for me, um, that was incredibly powerful because it was incredibly true. I think there are so many points in that show where I think to myself, "Wow, they did excellent research. They really yeah. they really uncovered a lot um, to put this show together." And just to say what an amazing actress she is, because she has that look on her face of someone like you just said it's safe here and you know we often see people who haven't known safety for such a long time that even when you say that it, they're like confused like what do you mean you know and how's this all going to work and so I think that actress was just so amazing at at playing that part mm -hmm. uh, so I see a couple of people wrote here um they loved getting a glimpse into the shelter. And someone mentioned, and if you'd seen the videos that we shared as part of the, the, uh, the days of action, um, we did give a tour of our shelter. We used that opportunity to give an inside, uh, the tour of the inside of our shelter. And I'm happy to share that link uh, with the participants here if you didn't see it so you can see what a real shelter looks like. Um, the shelter provided a dignified environment. Someone said, wow, she, she loved the shelter counselor. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, so. the shelter counselor was a bit of a miracle worker because she sort of did the job of like a hundred people in those episodes. So I don't know. Yeah. That part might not have always been the most realistic. We would we would like to have, you know, 20 of, of her. <laughs> well, so that was what was interesting. I think that, you know, the counselor and the shelter, um, there was one counselor for all those families. She did everything. She did all the intaking and the onboarding and the meal delivery and the accompaniments of the lawyer. And, you know, she did everything. This one person, she seemed to live there herself 24 seven, herself <laughs> a survivor of domestic violence, um, you know, ran the support groups. She really, she, she was like a, a Renaissance woman really all over the place, which is, is not the reality uh, in shelters. And, and, I think maybe for the best. We have, at least at Ober Shalom, our shelters are professionally trained, uh, social workers or psychotherapists. Um, each client, each, each person that comes to the shelter is assigned one counselor who they work with and who really accompany them every step of the way. For how kind of available that counselor was um, in the shelter, for example, Alex went to that first court case completely unprepared. Mm -hmm. She didn't yeah. know how to advocate for herself or how to make sure her daughter wasn't going to go home 
with with her abusive partner which is and one know, of the questions that someone asked was sort of like what are the differences between systems in the US and here and like Joanna said we can only really talk about ours but but to your point one of the things that we you know that that we sort of pride ourselves on at Ober Shalom and that we see is so important is the constant advocacy um, is really, you know, and that's why I was kind of laughing that she does it all because I don't, I don't know how you could possibly do all those things. Um, but the multiple counselors that we have where everyone's assigned, you know, everybody has their own worker, that worker is really thinking about how can I advocate constantly for this person in all realms? Sorry, I'll let you continue. Oh, fine. <laughs> um, the, yeah, there, there was a, there were, there are so many interesting points. I'm going to, I'm going to share. Um, <laughs> there's a, a, a number of us in our team. We kind of talked about how everything is so calm and kind of idyllic in a way in the shelter. You know, you see, you see the counselor and Alex walking down the hallway uh, smiling and they look kind of relaxed and uh, and everyone looks happy and you know the kids are, have tons of space to play and and it's not always like that in in a shelter environment our shelter for example um, is a house it truly is a home um, at this shelter there was a locked gate at the front door and there were guards around our shelter uh, walking by on the street, it looks like any other house on the street. You would have no idea that inside there were up to you know, nine families living side by side getting safety. Um, uh, and, and nine families in, in a home, you can imagine multiple kids running around. There's uh, people at all kinds of different stages of their grief and healing. So there's, there's really a lot of activity um, whereas what you saw in the show was individual apartments for, for every family. Uh, for us, it's more individual rooms for every family. Um, but I think that's nice, which brings me to um, something else that I thought was interesting in the show was this, the, the peer support. So she met this friend and this friend really um, helped her um, kind of overcome when she was stuck on the floor and couldn't get up, her friend really helped empower her and, and, and taught her a little bit from her own experience. And that's something that we see in our clients all the time, that, that peer support that develops, um, that, that learning opportunity that, that you recognize in someone else, something that you feel about yourself. Um, and so friendships kind of kind of grow very organically and very quickly. Um, you see that friend then return to the abuser uh, and pretends not to recognize Alex when you see her on the street. And while I don't know something exactly like that happening, we do know women do return a home. Um, someone mentioned in the chat um, that, uh, that she, you know, she, she came back to the shelter and she had a second visit and, and that's true, that happens. Uh, you know, women can come and go and, and we still see every step along that way as kind of a, a step towards success. Every time a woman reaches out, every time she takes a step, every time she learns something new, this is, these are small successes. And, and, and that's, that's, really, um, that's really what we, what the kind of environment that we strive to create, that this is a safe place, we won't judge you. We understand this is difficult. Recovery is not linear. Um, and, and you can come and go from our services just like in the show. Um, someone mentioned the store. If you remember the store where she goes shopping and that's empty, you know, price tags without any um, number on them. I love that. I'm like, in my mind, like we need, we need to have a store like that. So I'll show you a, a picture of, um, kind of our version of the store, I guess you could say. Um, like reality it? versus Hollywood, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's um, oh my goodness, I just lost it. And while you're doing that, I'll answer in the meantime, someone who asked how long women stay approximately. And Joanna can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it used to be uh, roughly six to eight weeks. Is that still? Yeah. 
They're, yeah. COVID, COVID slowed everything down. So women have stayed longer, but generally six, eight weeks. So this is the inside of our shelter. This is a bedroom and one of our dens, a common space, for example, looks a little bit different than what you see in the show. Um, and um, this is where we keep our <laughs> supply of, of clothing and boots and shoes and pajamas and toys and stuff like that. Um, this is, it's obviously not a store, it's a garage uh, where we, we, we collect brand new items that we give to clients um, when they come in according to their needs. So it looks a little bit uh, hectic in there. It is a little bit hectic, uh, but, uh, but it works for us. A store would be uh, idyllic. One day. Um, <laughs> one, one day. <laughs> one day the other thing that I thought was just so interesting in the shelter and then I'll pass it back to you taken was the the thing with the cell phones how they check their cell phones in at the beginning and then if they wanted to be on the phone you needed to walk down it was almost comical in a way taken and I were talking about this uh yeah. yesterday um you know when I when I started the shelter in 2014 sorry uh Bonnie you had a question go ahead no, I was just going to say, like, it, it it didn't kind of make sense to me. Like, they were all still congregating yeah. two blocks down from the shelter. Didn't that just seem like? Well, I was actually yeah. trying to find online to see if there was any articles about it, because I almost was wondering if the show creators were kind of trying to make light of the, the complications of what technology has brought to safety concerns. Because for instance, when I started working at the shelter, most people didn't even have cell phones. We were actually giving them um, like not smartphones, but you know, uh, flip phones so that they could take them for safety. Then burner. we got to the stage, <laughs> what's that? A burner phone. Yeah, like a burner, <laughs> is that Nancy? Basically. <laughs> breaking back, anyway, sorry, go on. <laughs> um, exactly, a burner phone and then we got to the point where we had to go into settings and turn off location services. And, you know, it's changed so many times and we have to keep changing, but it's like, I don't, you know, who knows if we're always fully keeping up. We, we obviously tried to, and I was kind of almost wondering, is the show kind of making fun of the fact that like, how safe is it for a group of women to leave shelter and walk a block away and stand on their cell phones, you know, in, in the, in the mm -hmm. middle of a, you know, the street corner. So, I, I, I don't know, you know, we definitely don't do that. We just, we just make sure that the phones are not traceable. And Joanna was telling me at one point there was a shelter that would tell women to wrap their phones in tin foil on their way to the shelter and then something to do with a microwave and very elaborate. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's pretty impossible to remain anonymous in the internet age, right? I mean, how do you stay off Google maps? Uh, it's really, really, really challenging. And so, you know, I would actually work at the shelter when there was a security breach. There was a partner who hacked into um, a woman's email and found our location. And, you know, the next day we installed a VPN, which would throw our internet signal around. So we couldn't be, be traced that way because things are just changing so, so, so quickly. Um, and someone mentioned that uh, maybe they took their phone so that they couldn't respond to their abusers. I mean, perhaps it, it's, uh, that seems, it's a little bit of a punitive way, I think, of working with-, with Well, it's certainly um, not our philosophy, right? We don't yeah. try to control, you know, our, our whole thing is we're here to help you with where you are right now. If a woman wants to, be talking to her partner in her bedroom that's up to her and you know um Jean mentioned it so that the calls aren't traced but that's the whole thing I was describing about location services I, I'm just saying the irony between we make sure that they're not traced back to shelter getting traced to a block away is not much better if you if you understand what I mean so it's it's complicated but um there was also a question that we skipped Joanna that maybe you could answer about the percentage of Jewish women versus other faiths? And are they mainly from the Orthodox community? I don't know if you have um, those statistics. Yeah, it's it, it, uh, between our two service points, it, it varies a little bit. Um, and we have seen a higher percentage of, of Jewish and Orthodox people coming to our services. We do 
so, so much work and outreach to make inroads into communities that are a little bit tougher to reach. Uh, and we're seeing that, that that has paid off, that there has been more awareness of our services and, and more women willing to reach out. Um, you know, people tend to think that that there might be more abuse in the Orthodox communities, which which is would be a misunderstanding. I don't think that there's more abuse, but rather there's less access to to getting out. There's less opportunity to to um, find resources, to to find the the counselor or the the shelter space that you need to to get safe. It's not that the numbers are higher; it's that the barriers are are taller and stronger for, for women to, to get to, can I, to get to safety. Can I ask a question based on that? Please. Uh, my name's Susan, and I'm uh, on the board of, of Toronto Section with all my other guys here who are in part of this. Um, I was responsible uh, and were, was co-chair of Turning the Page, where we put children's libraries into um, the AW shelters you know, uh, violence against women or for abused women. So I'm sort of very well aware of these things, but I we weren't aware of the fact that there was a Jewish shelter. I mean, we knew that there had been, but I didn't know that it was active. And I, I'm, it's really remiss of me. But what I'd like to be able to do is involve um, our Orthodox community in this situation because we have a large Orthodox population in, in Toronto in the same way you do in Montreal. And for a woman to leave, you know, to pick up with the clothes on her back and, and a baby or, or a little one on each arm and run, you know, you could be schlepping a, a 10 year old, a 12 year old out of a school and their school is a, quite often if they're Orthodox, it's a very sheltered environment and they don't want to give up their faith. So having said that, how do you talk to and get the support of the, um, the community? That's a big question for us to understand. That, that is a big question. Um, That's I, a great and, question. Yeah. We've, I think we've done a couple, Taken, I'll, I'll start in, and by all means okay. jump in. Um, uh, and I, I don't want to say the wrong thing. <laughs> I, I, uh, here's what I know that we've done. We do a lot of work um, with the Vada year here. Um, we do a lot of work with the, speaking with the rabbis and kind of just um, trying to start the conversation, open the conversation. We have worked a lot with the seminary schools. So we do a lot of prevention or healthy relationship workshops really in the seminary schools with, with women who are of marrying age, just pre or post marrying age. We actually did a stagiaire program. We had some stagiaires from a seminary school come and work with us for some time, um, which started a beautiful relationship between our school, their school and our organization. Um, we've done work with mikvah attendants um, to because they are in a very intimate setting with with women in a very private setting. Um, and so we've done some kind of, I guess, awareness and professional development training with the mikvah attendants to help them um, feel comfortable or at least equipped to have conversations with women who they who they might think are in um, dangerous situations. Um, you know, whether that, and it's the, advertisements the, in the um, newspaper. Sorry, go ahead. No, I just wanted to add the mentorship program, um, which is uh, um, something where we paired up some of our Orthodox clients with a mentor from the um, Orthodox community. And that, that mentor would go through our training program about, you know, understanding domestic violence, um, understanding warning signs, um, you know, how to get help, how to talk to someone, sort of the main things. And for, for the clients that participated in it, it was very beneficial. Um, I also think something that's interesting to mention about, about the Orthodox um, community and in the way that we work is that we have, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, a specialized Orthodox um, counselor to work with that clientele. Oftentimes, 
in, in my, in my sort of career at Ober Shalom, I have worked with so many Orthodox women because sometimes they will say, I prefer to have someone who's not in the community um, because they know that our organization understands enough about like that me as someone who's not Orthodox has enough of a good understanding about the Orthodox community that they prefer to have counseling from me because I'm not in the community. You know, that's not true for everyone. I just think it's worth mentioning because as much as some people are resistant to going somewhere that doesn't, you know, feel like kosher or, you know, like a, an accepting place, there's also something to be said about getting help from a little bit outside. And so we sort of see it on, on two sides. I don't know if that, does that answer? Thank you. I think it's really amazing. Um, and <laughs> what can I say? It's, it's just a wonderful. What you're doing. I will say, Susan, it's, um, it's been a long road. Um, there has been so much effort and energy gone into to building these bridges into the community. It hasn't always been easy, um, but it's been a priority for us to make sure that 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 we are visible and active there. Um, and I know my my colleague Linda is listening, and she I would say has been a driving force behind this, uh, uh, behind moving moving that 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 needle. Um, and, and we're starting, we're, you know, we're seeing the fruits of that really. Um, there's just and so I much think advocacy to be done. The thing is about, you know, why I'm so happy that so many of you attended, you know, wanted to attend to talk tonight, you know, because of this TV show and, and maybe not only because of the TV show, but the way that this show has um, started conversations you know, my, my whole thing that I talk about with my, with my friends, with clients, with colleagues, with everybody is we just have to start talking about this topic of conversation more and more. And, you know, I always talk about demystifying it because I'll sometimes joke that at the beginning of my career, when I talk to people about what I did, they would say like, ooh, like, you know, kind of joke that it's um, a conversation stopper. Like people don't want to get into it. They think it's taboo. The more, the fact that there is a very popular, you know, highly rated TV show that's covering it right now, the same principles apply to every community. The more you can just get people learning and, and sort of, um, you know, just understanding that this is a very real part of, of the world, um, you know, that, that we live in, whether we're in the Orthodox community or we're, or we're you know, in an American, you know, community like Alex is in the show it really you know she you you see how people even though she's experiencing it herself in that first meeting she has with the social worker she identifies as someone who's not abused because she wasn't hit and so just being able to talk to to anyone in all communities about what the what the reality is of emotional abuse psychological abuse um, how abuse can be subtle, how it can start, you know, and, and escalate over time. Um, you know, I, I also think, you know, I'm now jumping back to the show and, and please interrupt me, Joanna, if you want to go back. But one of the things that I think is so well done about the show is that they show Alex having happy memories. They do these amazing, warm and fuzzy flashbacks about all these loving and tender moments that she has with with Sean, her boyfriend. And, you know, that that's a really important part of portraying domestic violence. People don't normally, it, it does exist sometimes, but you're normally not starting the relationship with someone abusive. And so just, the, the, you know, the way that they, I'm sure a lot of people watch that show who were experiencing emotional abuse and, you know, it allowed them to sort of maybe validate their experience as something abusive. And I can tell you that uh, a day for sure, a week does not go by that a client says to me, I don't really know if I should be getting your services. I feel bad. I feel like somebody else probably needs it more than me. And I say, mm -hmm. well, if I, if I accepted you and I started working with you, it's because you're eligible and it's because, you know, I believe that we can help you and, and we want to help you and this is the right place for you. But it is such a common um, line of, of thinking. And, 
it is, it's sort of the whole reason that we want people, we want to create awareness. We want people to talk about it. We want people to talk about the show, you know, whatever it is, because, we want to we want to end the the feeling of it being a big you know a, a big secret that's yeah. why that's why people go back to their partners too right because they feel mm -hmm. like they shouldn't be if they feel that they shouldn't be then they probably why they go back yeah so i think the uh, the one of the things we wanted to talk about that we we kind of touched it in different ways and i am aware of the time and i want to be respectful of mm -hmm. everyone's time but taking it did you want to just take a minute and talk about why women stay and also why they mm -hmm. go back yeah um, i was just thinking because i was trying to jump ahead maybe to um to try to summarize this part but yeah yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll just try to jump into it so um yeah, sorry, I'm just kind of skipping ahead here. We talked about just the fact that we encounter professionals, even people that are, you know, in theory trained, lawyers, judges, police officers, other social workers, psychologists. And we hear them ask, but why did she stay then? Or well, why did she go back to him then? You know, like, how can it really have been what you're saying it is if she stayed or if she went back? And so when we when we learn about domestic violence and when we try to to teach about domestic violence, there are many reasons that we encounter um, that, that women stay. So there's the love, like we saw that the love that Alex has for Sean, the hope, which is probably the thing that I hear the most in, in, in my work, um, hoping that the person's going to change, um, you know, and, and kind of holding on to the, the belief that it's possible. Um, minimizing the abuse, which is often done by the abuser, but sometimes by the people around. Um, you know, blaming yourself. Well, you know, if I hadn't acted that way, it's true. I guess it was my fault. You know, that's what made him so angry, that type of thing. Fear, fear of the unknown, fear of what's going to come next, fear of being alone, not in a relationship. Guilt, shame. Um, and, you know, something that the show really does an excellent job of covering is the link between love and violence, the link between when you have grown up in an unhealthy, in a home that has um, unhealthy role models as parents um, and, you know, disrespect or you hear emotional put downs or any of those things, there's a way in which that becomes what you expect as normal in an intimate relationship. Even if you're not thinking about it like, okay, violence is normal. There's a part of you where it, it's become internalized. It's, 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 it's become part of, um, you know, your way of thinking. Um, and so also not wanting to be alone, trauma responses, you know, the way that people respond to, to trauma and when they have PTSD symptoms, that also keeps people being financially dependent on the other person, of course. Um, loyalty, feeling like you should stay and figure things out and be loyal. Um, and then, of course, the other thing the show does really well is children. So many people will tell us that they stayed because of their children or their child because they wanted to keep the family unit together. But like Alex in the show, oftentimes those same clients, especially ones that we might see a few times sort of coming and going from shelter, coming and going from counseling, will tell us that the children are often also the reason that they end up deciding to leave. Um, and so I, I know a bunch of questions just came in before yeah. I go on. Someone asked, um, you know, how do you, how do you suggest someone, you get someone to seek help who may not realize they actually need it? And so what I responded is, you know, you really have to wait for that person to know. That's an excellent question when we're asked all the time. Um, as a friend, you just stay supportive, you stay present, you stay non-judgmental, um, helping them recognize maybe um, their own feelings. Uh, and what they're going through. And I linked here from our website, we have a page on how to help a friend. Our website really um, has a ton of information that you can learn from about the signs of abuse, about um, 
you know, how to help a friend, where to, where to, to turn for help, etc. So I, I do encourage you to go and check out our website if you, if you want to learn more. Um, yeah. We're nearing and the end of our time. Yeah. Sorry. So, there's so much um, to say. <laughs> there's so much to um, say. Well, and something that, that Linda reminded me of, which is a very good point, which is a very well-placed fear that leaving the relationship could actually be the most dangerous time. Just yeah. like you said at the beginning, Joanna, that the show does such a good job of researching in terms of domestic violence. We see that they're very happy until she gets pregnant. Um, and, and, you know, that is a marker for domestic violence and then having a child and, and leaving a relationship, unfortunately, um, is, is a real uh, a factor in, in um, you know, elevated danger and why we take safety and confidentiality so seriously at the shelter and at our counseling um, office so that, you know, we make sure that we help a woman take every step and do everything she possibly can to ensure her safety and use whatever systems are accessible to us to, um, to, to try to help her feel safe and maintain that safety. But it is something that, you know, it's, it's, it's a big decision and having someone support you through it is, can make a huge difference. So, um, um, yeah. I guess, I guess to wrap it up, just to kind of um, repeat something that Tegan said earlier is, you know, this is Hollywood. It is a television show. It is beautiful and challenging and, um, you know, witty and domestic violence doesn't always happen like that or the re path to recovery doesn't always happen like that. But the, I think the best part about the show is that it has started the conversation. It really put the topic out on the table there are, you know, 66 people that have participated in this conversation tonight. And now you're all walking away with a little bit more um, nuanced understanding about domestic violence and what it might look like uh, in reality, which is um, not that far from the show, truly. Uh, and, and that's really, that's the best, that's the best thing that we could, we could hope, I think, to, to come from this show. Um, I do also, I want to, uh, well, maybe first, can I, can I open it up for questions? If there are any burning questions from people, Debbie, Linda, do we have a minute for that? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, great. Is there, is there, um, do you find clients also want to identify as abused? Is there stigma, particularly for some women in higher socioeconomic situations? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's something, you know, client, client's experiences are so unique, but you see Alex start at the beginning saying, well, I wasn't really abused because he only punched the wall, you know, next to me. Um, and you see her at the end, spoiler alert, um, talking about, you know, having suffered PTSD and suffered suffering trauma and she's sharing her writing with, with the other women and she really comes full circle. And I will say that clients that we see long-term in counseling will often start out not necessarily not wanting to identify, but almost not being sure that it's their right to identify or and, and I'm always very careful with new clients. You know, when I sense that they don't want to hear those words, I'll just, you know, even though I don't think it's just an unhealthy relationship, I will try to use, you know, more subtle language at the beginning. But part of the counseling is often sort of a, an education about what is abuse. And so if the client, if that same client sort of um, stays with us in this process, you know, whether it be at shelter or the counseling office, usually wherever they started, if they had some discomfort with it, they'll sort of come around to seeing like, I see now, you know, that that sort of the way that Alex's friend in that, in that quote I read before says to her, that was emotional abuse. You know, the friend is able to say that because it's her third time being in shelter and she's learned a lot about what abuse is. I'm sure she didn't, you know, have the words for that at the beginning. And so, yeah, I hope that answers it. And I see that do you know someone, how to end up? Someone asked, where does the majority of your funds come from? Um, okay. so 
for us um, in Quebec, we're part of a federation of women's shelters. Um, we get a lump sum of funding from the government, which is then distributed equitably, um, depending on how many beds you have. So about 60% of our funding comes from the Quebec government. Um, being a kosher shelter, obviously our costs are a little bit higher. Our food is kosher, our cooks um, are kosher, and um, just the, the other kinds of, of uh, accommodations that, that we make. So 40% of our budget, we do fundraise from privately through individuals, foundations, and grants. Can we unmute uh, Dina? Or can sure. you unmute yourself? <laughs> um, so I have a couple of things to say. Uh, I've been part of the shelter movement since before it opened. Uh, I was one of the 10 women. And so I'm so grateful that you're doing this forum tonight. Um, as, a, as a social worker and then as a private practitioner and a community practitioner, I've worked with a lot of women over the years. And you're right, many women don't see the violence that they're living. And if you're a friend, if you look up the cycle of violence online, it will describe it. And when you just talk about, is this been similar to your experience? Women actually see it mm -hmm. label. Mm -hmm. There's a very specific, there's a specific cycle that gets repeated. And yeah. as well, this is transgenerational. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the other very important theme that we were hoping to discuss, but we didn't get to. But it's the other thing the show does really well, which is the intergenerational or transgenerational um, patterns of abuse. And actually, the show creator uh, in one of her interviews said the thing that she's the most proud of with the show, which I agree with, is, you know, that she did such a good job of is how they show what it feels like to be trapped to be stuck and they use that image of the couch and she's just she can't get up off the couch and then the couch is swallowing her and you know she she went back she gave him a chance and things got so much worse yeah that's the couch <laughs> and um you know it's I think it does a beautiful job of showing the the cyclical patterns that Alex is really trying to break the, the intergenerational patterns of abuse in her own family. Um, and, you know, it, 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 sh it, it just really shows the essence of what it feels like to be stuck in it. Um, and just, you know, I wanted to go back just to the last question, just to add one more thing, which is yes, you know, about who, people who don't wanna call themselves abused. It's true that there are many clients who will say to us, like, how can I be, this successful in my career and have this education, you know, like a client of mine who's brilliant and, and she has, you know, so many degrees and a, an amazing career and, you know, PhD and, and uh, an amazing person in so many ways. And it's one of the, the big things that she struggled with in counseling was coming to terms with the fact that it's not because she's not smart that this happened to her. You know, she was she got stuck in the way that um, many people do. Um, but it is sort of a common thing. Like, how did this happen to me? How did I fall into this trap? You know, and, and that sort of thing. And so we're careful with the labels we use, but yes, to, your, to, to whoever asked that question before, it's a good point. Yeah, language is, is potent. And we've had, you know, some people who want to be identified as a survivor and others who don't, some who want to be, you know, kind of self-identified having been victimized, others who just don't like the word victim at all. And so we take our cues from each individual that we're working with. Any other, did we miss anything in the chat? I was trying to go up to see. Oops. Well, I was just going to say if we did, and especially if it's about helping somebody who wanted to help, um, potentially help a friend who maybe doesn't know that they need help or doesn't see it. You, you know, I'm about to go on vacation for two weeks, but otherwise 
you can you can call us you can call me specifically if you want to you can call our hotline we're there to answer questions about those kinds of things and to try to um, give not just just victims or survivors that are dealing with it but guidance for if you're the mom of someone if you're the sister of someone friend of someone you know sometimes it's a neighbor you know we have this beautiful quote on our website from one of our clients because it was a neighbor that really had this um, non-judgmental open to talk you know approach with her that was the difference between her not getting help and getting help and so you know that I know we're probably trying to wrap, wrap up and I want to let everybody um, go but you know that that is one of the things that I would want to leave you all with is if you hear someone out there talking about you know maybe it wasn't so bad if she stayed or those kinds of thoughts, the information that you've learned in watching this show or just going online, going on our website, use your voice for the people who don't have a voice because that's what happens in these relationships. They lose their voice and speak up, talk about it. Don't be scared to talk about this subject. It's not a fun topic. Um, it's, you know, like I always used to, to, like I was saying before, being a conversation stopper, but I'm not afraid of it being a conversation stopper anymore. <laughs> and so, you know, just to encourage you all to, to use your voice and ask questions. And we're there if there are anything, you know, if you want to help, if you want to find out more, anything, we're there to try to answer those questions. Can um, I just ask one, one more question? If yes. you were to focus on a specific need, where would you put getting good legal help as opposed to good social help in terms of social workers in this shelter situation? That's an amazing question. Wow. Um, <laughs> right now, I feel like it should be equal because I, I feel that a social workers can take on a lot of different roles, you know, and I can, I've learned a lot about the legal system because of this job, but I'm not a lawyer and I can't give clients legal advice. And if every one of my clients could have a lawyer of, you know, a, a certain caliber that's ready to answer the phone and answer their emails and fight for them and not just kind of want to do the easiest thing, which is, which is what we see. Um, I don't know, Joanna and my colleagues who are on here right now, if they want to pipe in, but I would say that it's, I, I would say in an ideal world, it should be equal. I got Linda a has a comment. I would like me to unmute, so <laughs> I don't know. I, oh, I'm on mute. I don't think I'm on mute anymore. Okay, Judy, yeah. Judy, I see you. We're coming back to your question after Judy. Linda's just going to answer. Okay. Yeah. Did you um, want to go? I, first of all, yes, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Linda, go ahead. I just want to first of all say thank you so much, Joanna and Tegan, for being you're just uh, awesome and the team is awesome and it's the resilience really that I feel that we have in the organization of the counselors, of the advocates, that is the biggest help that really women can get. Um, to the question of what we need most. I think uh, the one thing that I've experienced is that uh, domestic violence is an extremely complex issue. And we need to try and um, avoid the trap of trying to find easy answers. The, the answers are going to be as complex as the issues are. For uh, one person, it might be legal, aid is the one thing that she will need the most to get out of the hell that she's living. And for another person, it'll just be supportive counseling and therapy. So there are so many layers to domestic violence and so many factors that contribute. It's the support system. You know, we one of our main goals is uh, trying to support the resilience that women come with. Um, remembering though that for some people, resilience might be an innate trait uh, that they're born with, uh, such as what we saw in Maid with Alex. She was ready to fight all by herself. Uh, for most of us, however, we need to remember resilience really is um, 
it's the support that we get from each other, from the environment, from uh, the family, uh, from the friends that we have, and certainly the professionals that uh, we try to access. So this is really something that to keep in mind whenever we're tempted to try and find a simplified answer to the big question of domestic violence is really to try and really remember that it's not simple. It's really complex. Love is a very complex bond that exists and you know, attachment uh, is as, as well. And to try and really work it out in a way that um, you know, finds just the easy answers, I think we're, we're, this is where we go wrong. Uh, a lot of the time. This is where the system goes wrong as well. Uh, sometimes when we access uh, the legal system or any other system, it's really trying to simplify something that really isn't simple. So yeah, it's very just... well put. And it's probably because I was in court today that I feel like it should be equal. And you're, you make an excellent point. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Judy, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Judy Lear. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm from the United States. And uh, the hat that I am wearing today is from International Council of Jewish Women. Uh, Debbie, thank goodness, um, very nicely uh, told me about this conference and I'm so thrilled to be on. Uh, uh, I am on the Status of Women cha um, Committee for ICJW, and violence against women is one of the things that we have been talking about a lot. Uh, I congratulate you. This was an outstanding program, and you are all absolutely right. Talking about it is the only way of stopping it. And the legal system is one of the ways. And so I am just going to mention, because as you said, if people don't know about it, they won't talk about it. So I am involved right now in the Every Woman Treaty, which International Council of Jewish Women actually right at a meeting there in Canada, uh, accepted that they wanted to um, to be participate and be a supporter of the <clears throat> Every Woman Treaty. Um, that is an attempt to make a worldwide effort to stop violence against women. And it has, um, of course, had a lot of pushback. Uh, but I want you to know about it. I want you to know that there are a group of women on an international basis. I, and I want you to also know that one in three women around the world are in some kind of a violent situation, some kind of violence against women. And what you are doing here today and NCJW Canada, you are outstanding, just outstanding. I applaud you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. Are there any other final questions? So before we go, and we do have some resources that we'll flash on the screen and share with you, but um, on behalf of, of myself and Ober Shalom, we wanted to give tremendous thanks to, to Debbie and Linda for inviting us here tonight. Um, Ober Shalom exists only because the National Council of Jewish Women uh, exists, because there was a, a, a group of um, of really committed women who, who went out and, and fought for the creation of Ober Shalom. It was at a time 35 years ago when no one uttered the word domestic violence. What those women heard time and time again is Jewish men don't hit their wives. That's what they heard every time that they talked about creating this resource. Um, but this group of fierce women didn't stop until they created a safe home for all. And um, it means so much for us to be participating in this, in this event with the National Council. Um, you're our roots, you're the foundation on which our house sits. So thank you so much for, for having us here and, um, and putting us on the map. Joanna? And Tegan, um, perhaps you can spotlight me. Thank you. Hi, uh, Joanna and Tegan, thank you so much for your presentation this evening. 
For those of you who don't know me, my name is Linda Steinberg and I'm a VP on our national board. I see like I'm really way up in there. <laughs> uh, Joanna and Tegan, through your presentation and insightful comments, you have answered all of our, you have answered our initial question. Netflix is made, is this a reality for Canadian women? Unfortunately, as we heard today, this is a reality. And as you've heard so many times today, Netflix has made has brought this important issue to light. Joanna and Tegan, you have taken us many steps forward to understanding the complexity of intimate partner relationship, intimate partner violence. There are many resources for women to turn to in Montreal, Toronto, and throughout Canada and the US as we know. In Toronto, in addition to government and nonprofit organizations, victim services in York Region and Toronto, both independent services from the police, provide a first response to the needs and safety of women and children and their children. Education is a step towards eradication of gender based violence. Victim Services Toronto and other organizations have developed teen workshops, tutoring opportunities, videos on, to, on YouTube for teens and more to promote healthy relationships. And these, those two numbers you can look up on the internet, but we will have them in the chat for you for Victim Services Toronto and Victim Services in York Region. National Council of Jewish Women of Canada, as part of our mandate, is raising awareness of violence against women and human trafficking. Joanna and Tegan, thank you for sharing your expertise. To our participants, thank you for attending tonight's presentation and being part of the conversation through your questions. And I know we didn't get to all of them, but we did get to most of them. We hope that in the future, we will see you at more and more of our NCJWC programs. Thank you so much and have a good, a good night and be healthy and be safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna put this up on the screen for anyone oh, yeah. who might want it. Um. You want uh, this is if if you're actually looking for help if you need resources to get help um, and and Debbie we're happy to also put this in a in a PDF and share with you you can email it out to all the participants if you'd like um, and then as well we have this slide which is if you want to learn more about intimate partner violence these are some resources some books that you can check out um, and some websites in, including our own website at the bottom which has plenty of resources. Joanna, please send it to, to me, it's Debbie. Yes, thank sure. you. My pleasure. Share it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank All you right, everybody. thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, and thank you.